now Helena is going to um, pull up the uh, pull up Sandy's um, form thirteen point one financial statement, and kind of walk us through how how Sandy's um, calculations are done, and also how it changes right with the matrimonial home situation. Okay, so everybody should be able to see what we just went through with Robin. Now we're going to go through exactly the same exercise with Sandy. So Sandy's spouse A, there's Robin's listed there, confirming who we are, that this is the um, financial statement for Sandy, who is spouse A. And I just said Sandy lived in Hamilton because I live in Hamilton. It's a cool <laughs> place to be. We are not worrying about support. So we're not talking about income and expenses and budgets. We are flipping down to the same place we went to for Robin, which is, yeah. here we go. Assets in and out of Ontario. Yes. That's the other important thing to keep in mind as well. Um, the financial forms really, really give you a lot of good guidance. When you talk about an equalization of net family properties, you're not only doing an equalization of the value of property that is located in Ontario, mm. it's property located anywhere in the world. Mm. So you have to include that. If you right. own property in Australia, like a, 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 a summer home or something, you have to include it on your net family property statement. Now, right. the problem that's going to come up is that because you own that property, it will impact what you have to pay in an equalization payment or what you might receive. But if you are the one that has to make a payment, um, it could be very, very difficult to try to enforce or do something against property that's owned in another, another country to, to try getting your equalization payment out. So that's where the issue comes in. You have to include the value for property that's owned no matter where it is in the world, but mm. you get to do the same, offset any debts anywhere mm. in the world. Mm -hmm. But if anybody ever has to go after those assets, then it oh, could wow. be very, very difficult trying to do it because Canadian courts don't have jurisdiction to deal with property that are in other countries. But you do count the value for the purposes of doing an equalization. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So now we're back on the form 131, but this is Sandy's and we're back to the same form where Robin was going through it. So again, we're still talking about the same situation is that um, there was no matrimonial home either on the date of marriage or on the date of separation and no home today. Um, they've, they've been renting a place all along. They've never, Sandy has never owned a house. He and Robin always lived in a rented property. So, um, but Sandy did all have a little bit more in the way of property than Robin has. So we've got the total household goods and furniture. He had $1,000 worth of um, furniture on the date of he or she. Sandy had $1,000 of furniture worth of furniture on the date of marriage. Now owns $15,000 worth of furniture. Now down to 6,000. Maybe Sandy had to do a garage sale to keep some money up to pay debts or whatever. But like I said, but today's figures are really there for interest more than anything else. Right. Okay, um, Sandy also had vehicles. He had a 2008 Ford Escort and a 2019 Series 3 BMW. So, and again, you can tell the story here is that he had the Ford Escort on the date of marriage and it was worth $20,000. Didn't have it anymore on the date of separation and obviously doesn't have it now. Mm -hmm. The BMW didn't have it on the date of marriage, obviously bought mm -hmm. it during the course of the marriage, and it's worth $36,000 as of the date of separation. It's, again, decreases in value every year, so mm -hmm. you have to take that into account, so now it's worth $33,000. Now, here we get going. This is interesting. Um, Sandy, this is a Picasso sketch I was talking about. He actually, in this scenario, he had the Picasso sketch given to him before marriage. It was property owned on the date of marriage. So it doesn't matter where the Picasso sketch came from. If he had it before marriage, it goes into property owned on the date of marriage. And the Picasso was worth $50,000 when they got married. Now that uh, Robin and Sandy have separated as of the valuation date, that Picasso sketch has the value has increased to $75,000. And it's gone up another $5,000 since the date of separation. So this is an asset that keeps accumulating more value. Then we have a second sketch. This is the Rubens. Didn't have the Rubens on the date of marriage. They he had it on, or Sandy had it on the date of separation. It was worth forty five thousand dollars, and it is now worth fifty thousand um, dollars. And when he came, when Sandy came into the marriage, he had a computer worth and equipment worth three thousand. Had a computer and monitor worth five thousand on the date of um, separation. And it's depreciated in value a bit since then. But these are the key numbers that we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. So, and again, you're doing that whole total. So the total value of household items and vehicles that um, 
Sandy Ohms was 74,000 on the date of marriage, 176,000 as of the date of separation. So then we go through bank accounts and pensions. So just like Robin, um, Sandy had a checking account and a savings account. But again, you can see that he had 3,000 in the checking account when the parties got married. It was 5,500 on the date of separation. Sandy had 12,000 in savings when they got married. Now there's 15,000 in Sandy's saving account. Um, there's an RSP that Sandy has as well. And he's, he, she has been contributing to it throughout the course of the marriage. So it's increased in value from 4,000 to 12,000. And just for fun, I threw in the fact that um, there is a pension, but we're not gonna get into the really detailed stuff about pensions because you have to start figuring out um, tax consequences and everything else. But just for fun, he didn't have a pension when they were married. The value of the pension appraised on the date of separation is $14,000. And again, he still has the pension, so it's way up in value. So the total value of those assets on the date of marriage was 19,000, worth 46,500 on the date of separation. Um, we're not gonna, he didn't, or Sandy, he or she did not have any life or disability insurance, no interest in any business, nobody owes Sandy any money, no other property that didn't get covered in any of them. So now we're totaling up the value of all property owned on valuation date, which is separation date. And uh, so you can see where it is that on the date Sandy got married, had net family property worth 93,000. On the date of separation, it's pretty much getting close to a quarter million dollars, $222,500. So that's the value of assets. So now you go through and you knock off all the debts. So again, you're just going through the whole thing as an arithmetic function. These are the debts that are out there that um, Sandy had a credit card, still has the credit card, owed 6,000 on the date of marriage. It was down to 3,000 by the date of separation and two car loans. So this one would obviously be for the motorcycle. And so we have the, the value of the motorcycle on the date of marriage, but now we get to see, well, he didn't own it free and clear. He, there was a loan on it. So he owed 15,000 on the motorcycle mm -hmm. and doesn't owe that loan anymore on the date of separation. The other one would probably be for the BMW. It didn't exist on the date of marriage, but there's, as of the date the party separated, this car, remember, was worth 36,000 on the date of separation up in the assets part, but he still owed 30,000 on it on the date they separated. So that means the net value on that vehicle is only $6,000. So you see how all the numbers come into play. So now this is the total of all the debts that Sandy had on date of separation was 33,000. He had 21, he, she had debts of 21,000 on the date of marriage. And so all those numbers that were listed in the columns on date of marriage, when they're rolled up and summarized, this is where they go. So it shows that these are all the assets that Sandy owned on date of marriage. These were the debts Sandy owed on date of marriage. And when you come to that, then the debt value of the property is the 93,000 less the 21,000 in debt. So that's 72,000. And so when you take out all of the deductions, that takes you down to 105,000 uh, is the total of the deductions on the date like for what he's entitled to, to claim. So now remember we were talking about the excluded property. There mm -hmm. was that um, Rubens. It was inherited from the mother during the course of the marriage. So Sandy is claiming an exclusion of 45,000. He claimed the value of 45,000 as an asset on date of separation. Now he gets to back that number out because it was something he received by way of a gift or an inheritance, such as um, during the marriage. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing he's got to exclude. So now when you can drop down to the bottom here, you're looking at this situation. So on Sandy's Form 13 financial statement, when you wrap it all up, the value of all the property owned on valuation date, which is valuation date is generally always equivalent to the separation date. Um, there's some times that the valuation date may be different, but that's a really technical thing and it doesn't happen very often. So normally assume when you see valuation date, it means date of separation. So on the date of separation, Sandy had $222,500 worth of property. The deductions are the debts, and what he had as of the date of marriage, you get to claim as deductions so that he gets to deduct a total of 105,000. 
that takes his the value of his property that's up for equalization down to 117,500. And then you take out the excluded property, that, that Ruben sketch, 45,000. So the number that drops at the bottom is Sandy's net family property is $72,500. That's what's up for grabs that needs to be equalized. So we're all good for that? Right. Down so two. yeah, so um, Sandy's net family property is uh, quite a bit higher. Than okay, and now we can actually show what happens, how this works, because what right. we just did here in this exercise is both Robin and Sandy did their own form 13-1. Right. You can see that this is a sworn document. So yes. each of them is swearing under oath that what they are providing in here is true. Mm. But it, it's pretty well divided up. That all you see here is Sandy's stuff. Uh, when we went through Robin's financial statement, all you saw was, was Robin's stuff. So now you put it together because now you got to do an equalization of the net family properties. So All right, so where we just ended up is we did the review of the 13.1s with the property and debts parts um, figured out for both Sandy and Robin. Mm -hmm. So where the next form is now that you look at is the form 13B, which is actually the net family property statement. And what the net family property statement actually does is it pulls all of the rolled up information from each party's 13.1 financial statement right. and puts it all together. So you've got both parties' information together in the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. So here we have Sandy and Robin as the spouses. Then again, confirming that, um, Sandy is one that prepared this net family property statement. The evaluation date is April 1, 2021, which is when they separated. They got married September 30th, 2010. So again, this is the scenario where there is no matrimonial home. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, this is going to be the main trigger that's going to change the different scenarios we work through. So here we go, and it's a basic summary of all of the information that we walked through item by item on each party's financial statements, mm -hmm. rolled up and included here. So here is the information on as of date. Now we're talking about valuation date values. No matrimonial home, but here is all the other property things that we were talking about. So applicant is Sandy, respondent mm -hmm. is Robin. Remember Robin, as of the date of separation, all that Robin had in the way of jewelry or art was her ruby ring, so there it's listed. Sandy had the two sketches and there's the value of it included. Remember we talked about Sandy having the two vehicles. There yeah. they are with the values shown. And he had the 15, he, she had the $15,000 worth of furniture. So just again, so this is um, value of household items and vehicle on valuation date. Then you go through the bank accounts and savings. You go through the same exercise that we did before. You just put in what each of them had and we're all talking now on date of separation. Mm -hmm. And because we kept this back scenario simple, they don't have any of this other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So when you go through that, then for each party, the value of property owned on the valuation date, these are the numbers that were like summarized on each of their financial statements. But mm -hmm. like on the financial statement, you get to see how you actually got down to that number. Right. That information is kind of summarized here. But like I said, they put it together. So you're looking at both parties. So for the value of property owned on separation date, Sandy's at 222,500, Robin is 23,000. Then you go through the same exercise for what did each of the parties owe on the date of separation. And it walks through all the numbers that were on the form 131 mm -hmm. for each of them. I'm not even gonna bother spending a lot of time. People, if they're really, really keen, they can go and take a look at them and work their way through it to make sure that our arithmetic is right and we didn't miss anything. But everything that was included on either one's form 13-1 is dropped into this statement. So there you get to do the deduction for debts. And here's the deduction again for the excluded property. Right. Sandy does not have to include the value of the, the Rubens because it was a gift or an inheritance during the course of the marriage. So when you take out the excluded property, that's that amount. Um, then the total of the property on owned of date of marriage was this amount. And this is where you start getting into the real calculations. Mm. So there you have, you have each party's debts and liabilities. Then you have the value of property owned on the date of marriage. And you've got the value of the excluded property. And then what is your total? So mm. it's total two minus total three plus total four. Sandy's property is 150,000. 
Robbins is 21,000. And when you go that like for the, the what they can deduct. So now we're saying this is the total value of what Sandy had on the date of separation. This is what Sandy is entitled to exclude. So Sandy's net family property is 72,500. That's the same number that we saw in his financial statement. Mm -hmm. Rob or her financial statement, Sandy's financial statement, he, she, or it. Respondent, again, we are talking about Robin and Robin is down at $2,000. Oh. So you equalize net family property. That is what Sandy is going to be required to pay Robin on an equalization of net family properties. Sandy will pay Robin $33,250. And there, that's, that's simply how it works. And again, what you're seeing is happening here is we're not talking about shifting property around. Now we know that just on the basis of who owns what and who owed what in the way of debts and what they've excluded, Sandy is gonna owe Robin $35,250. Now it's gonna be up to Sandy to figure out how to make that equalization payment. Um, they don't, there's no house, but he might sell his, or again, not necessarily he, Sandy might sell their BMW. They might sell the Reuben. They might sell the Picasso. They can do whatever they want. It's their property. They just need to come up with the money to pay Robin $35,250. Right. But that's interesting. And you know what, uh, how not, I really like this form 13B because this is where everything kind of sort of comes together in, in my head anyways, because yep. Uh, yep. ultimately, yeah, the goal is to figure out each spouse's NFP. And then at the very end is because you want to figure out who pays who. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm actually going to, this is going to be fun because I'm going to take a note and I'm going to mm. say that, okay, this is the scenario with no matrimonial home. Right. Yeah, they, 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 there was nobody ever owned a real, any real estate that their home that they lived in was always rented. Right. So I'm just making a quick note that the equalization payment that Sandy owes Robin is $35,250. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and then let's <laughs> sign back in and then we're going to do the, the matrimonial home ones. Okay. Okay.